Alrighty. Black Kitty just knocked over a whole stack of shit and blew bloody cat food all over the floor. Little bugger. Anyway. I'm often encouraged by Tony Mullins to make videos on sheep and sheep related stuff. Now, while it isn't off grid per se, um, those of you who are interested in homesteading, sheep are a good option. Uh, you know, there's ones that we have here. There's umpteen different breeds, quite a number of different breeds. Um, some we have here which are suited to hot weather, others that they have, well, both here and in England that are suited to cooler weather. Uh, some are bred for meat, some are bred for wool, like the ones we've got are sort of hotter weather wool. Um, and there's some, like they have in South Africa, that are a bit of both. But if you're interested in homesteading and want to produce your own meat and are a little bit wary of having something as big and uncontrollable as a cow, um, and either you're not into pork or you know what I know about pigs, that is that, let's face it, they're not as hard to handle as cows, but if they want to go crackers, you can't really stop them. There's one at work that is 450 to 500 kilos, somewhere within that range. He is close to half a ton, and as the boss told me at work, a lot of these pigs, if they decide they're going to just go through something, if they run out of something they'll just go straight through it and some of you mightn't like pork, some of you may realise that uh, pigs can be a little bit like cows, a little bit too heavy to handle but sheep is not like that and it's also red meat that tastes, the closest thing it tastes to is, is probably beef um, it doesn't taste anything like pork or chicken, but uh, it's not quite beef taste, but it's it's about the closest thing you can compare it to. So anyway, I want to talk a bit about the ways they think and um, get about things and do things and, and the sort of little group mentality they have and the way things work with um, lambs and sheep and rams and weathers um, and ewes and all that sort of stuff. Might as well start with a few basic definitions. A ram is a male with his nuts on. He will grow because of the hormones in his system by having his nuts on. He will grow significantly bigger than weathers, which are males with the nuts cut off. Regardless of the fact that both male, there's quite a size difference between weathers and rams. And weathers aren't terribly bigger than ewes, which are the females. Um, generally speaking with a sheep, you have oh, about one to a hundred ratio of rams per sheep. Um, it all sort of depends. Um, I think we have more than that, but that's realistically all you need. Um, and as a result, your genetic improvement, your selective breeding is selected by picking the right ram, basically and people are very fussy about what rams they have. In fact, I know somebody who paid $20,000 for a ram. By the way, that one has made him probably about a quarter of a million dollars in the last five, six years. Um, yeah, the way they think, now obviously lambs are the babies. It's often feared that rams are going to be more aggressive than ewes because the rams are the big romp and stomp and males and everybody's scared of bulls but not so scared of cows. Don't really worry about rams. 
they're not such a problem generally, except when you get a couple of opposing rams together. And they will butt heads much the same that you see mountain goats butting heads and all that sort of thing. Um, and let me tell you, there's been some going at it, not just at the front of my house here. And by hell, you can you can hear the crack noise when they come together, you know, and and you know they really get into it. And other rams, you know, some will fight, and others will get on fine together. You never really know. Um, my uncle had a pair that were friends together and used to hang around all the time, you know, uh, with each other and never fought with each other. And um, weathers, as a result of not having any nuts, they don't really have any sexual interest, whereas rams, you'll see them chasing a sheep around the paddock and just keep following it and following it and it'll try and wander away and walk away and it'll sort of be trying to get away sort of thing, not desperately running, but just sort of keep running forwards and this ram will be following it round and round and, well, it's not unknown for it to have its tongue hanging out and stuff like that. Um, particularly if it's been kept separate from the ewes and it's only just come in there. Um, weathers are probably quite good for eating and stuff like that. Um, so a sheep, so a lambs once they hit about, oh, I don't know, nine months, something like that. Um, in fact, what you usually do is you use a board lester, which is sort of a, a British sheep, um, as a ram, and have merino, which is like your your board lesters are sort of more a meat sheep. They do use the wool, but they're sort of wool is in a million dollars, um, and they're quite good, really quite good eating wise. They're terrible on fences. My uncle used to have them. Um, and you use a board lister ram and usually merino ewes and you get what they call fat lambs. Now, because these are sort of a bit of both breeds, they tend to grow bloody fast. Um, and there are a lot of the ones that are used in this country for a lamb that you buy in the supermarket. In fact, down at Chinese Boss's Vineyard, uh, there was somebody who had sheep running amongst that vineyard that was, um, and that was fat lambs that they were doing. And um, <clears throat> lambs of about nine months of age, sheep, I recommend nothing older than three and a half years for both sheep and weathers um, when it comes to eating. Rams. If he's under three and a half years old and he hasn't been, he's been kept on his own and he hasn't been having sex with all the ewes, he'll be fine. If he's, like, meat taste wise, he'll be fine. If he is out with all the ewes, going at it all the time, there's a hormonal change and it makes the meat taste very strong and some people don't like the smell of it and you might find that it's not really what you want to eat and uh, if you've got a fussy dog or cat they mightn't like it either um, but it'll probably do all right with dog food and uh, all that but yeah the taste is different I have never actually tasted it but I've just been told about the taste of ram because it's pretty much common practice not to bother butchering rams because everybody knows that it's not really quite the right taste. Um, as for the mentality of lambs, they will stick by their mother hellfire or high water. If she dies, they will stay beside her for, you know, a while. If they're sort of Oh, like 10, 12 weeks old, they'll start to go and hang around with the other lambs and graze, you know, probably within 30 metres or so of her, 
um, and then they might come back and sleep beside her at night or something like that. Um, there is a time where, like with children, they all start playing together. The same with lambs, they all start playing together. Um, but you sort of hit that point at... Yeah, probably about 10 or 12 weeks, something like that. They all start to hang around in groups. Uh, and you'll see as many as... Oh... Now, it might only be three together, but I've seen as many as 12 all playing together in a group. Um, they do these little skips and hops and sort of spring around, and it's bloody funny to watch. Um, and I, I've got a video of it when it happens, because um, <laughs> it looks hilarious. It's sort of like a funny skip, but it's almost like a bouncing hop, and they do that amongst each other and just frolic around and muck around when they're about 10 or 12 weeks old. The danger period of losing them is pretty bad within the first four weeks, like dying of wind chill. Um, you know, and I'll tell you the honest truth. A lot of it is neglect by the mothers to an extreme extent. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples, but that varies with breeds. Um, when they hit about the, you know, it's very risky to lose them within the first four weeks. When they hit six weeks, they're probably going to make it. If once they hit eight weeks, they're definitely going to make it. Um, you know, in terms of dying unexpectedly or dying, you know, yeah. Um, for those of you who think nothing advances with farming, I'll tell you the invention of elastrator rings, which is, it's basically, uh, I can't, I don't have any to show you because it's something that you don't just leave lying around because uh, they're not terribly, I think they're about 70 cents each or something, um, but they're a very small but exceedingly thick ring of rubber and you whack it it's you got this bizarre blooming thing it looks like pliers but there's actually like four bits of wire and you slip it over the top and then you pull the handle and it opens it up slip it over his nuts and then you let the handle go what you actually do is you pull it away um, <coughs> you lower it a fair bit and then pull it away and it just drops off the end of the bits of wire onto his nuts they used to have something like a 60% mortality rate from cutting it off with a knife. Now, with the lacerator rings, it's close to zero mortality rate um, from getting rid of their nuts. This is in regards to turning baby rams, so to speak, you know, little male lambs, uh, into withers. When you do that, you don't want to do that any older than... You definitely don't want to do it at the 12-week mark, really speaking. Um, it's the sort of thing where <laughs> the later you leave it, the worse it is. The younger, the better. But if that's something you can get onto at, at you know ten weeks old, good. I've I've seen some that were done. It was ridiculous. It was like sixteen weeks old or something like that, and that was painful. And I saw them laying down for the next three and a half hours, you know, sort of. And you could tell the poor buggers were in pain, you know. But you don't want to let it go past the twelve week period um, if you you do that sort of thing. But but uh, if you can, I'd say the earliest realistic time, you know, do it six or eight weeks is probably the best time. Um, the ewes are all very... <laughs> I'll talk about the neglect. If you've got crossbreds, as they sometimes call them here, like more your meat breeds, um, sometimes they refer to meat breeds as crossbreeds, you know, crossbreds, 
but your meat breeds, your board lesters and that will be very good uh, with lambs. Like you can take the lamb off them for a while and give it back to them and they won't freak out. And they seem to be very good mothers. The merinos, which are the ones we got, are pretty friggin' shit actually. And I've seen some corridors that weren't much better. Um, and basically, if they're under any stress, they will, to reduce their stress, they basically just neglect their lamb because they're too busy worried about themselves and their own survival. Um, they'll basically just, like if there's any danger or any threat, they'll just flee like shit and leave the lamb to get eaten alive by a fox, by, if you're in the States, by coyotes, wolves, whatever. Um, they sort of, they don't give a shit, really speaking, about their lambs, uh, the merinos and the wool breeds. Um, I have seen, I think it was Corridales, be fed and these things gave birth to a lamb and just guy come round with a blooming tractor to feed them and these things just abandoned their lambs just to chase a bit of grain that was being poured on the ground. And the lamb was marrying and marrying and Just ignore it. Heaps of them done it. He told me that this was a regular occurrence, you know, and I said, to, why don't you say something to the boss? You know, you're losing that many. Oh, well, this is the way he wants it done. And I just sat there thinking, this is bullshit. They were losing, just by feeding these things grain, they were probably losing four a day out of a flock of, you know, maybe... Oh, no more than 150, 160. They were losing it. They're, they're dropping like flies just because they give birth to a lamb, see the feed coming, run away from the lamb, chase this tractor as, as much as blooming a quarter mile um, just to get this grain. And the lamb would be left a quarter mile back there, barren, barren, barren. They just forget about it. And he said he'd be picking up the thing the next day dead. It's just the way it was because that's the way the and the boss, you know, didn't sort of realise it, you know. If you ever think a couple of lambs dead around here or something, you should have seen this place. They were picking up sometimes 22 a day, chucking them in a hole. Friggin', oh, it was bullshit. Um, but anyway... That's uh, just those, you know, your wool breeds. They're, they're freaking useless when it comes to them. Any stress, any panic, any dogs, foxes, coyotes, wolves, anything like that, bang, just abandon the lamb. And even ones out here, I see, like, they sort of, they ignore them, basically. They start barren, and these things will be busy eating, and... Lamb will bear and bear and bear and I'll, I'll say, you know, something like, whose friggin' lamb is this or something usually? And the lamb might be bearing its guts out for two, you know, two, two and a half minutes sort of thing. And then finally the sheep will just go, bah, like that. And then the lamb will come running towards it. They're so interested in eating, they couldn't give a shit that the lamb is panicking that it can't find them. I couldn't care less. Because, hang on, hang on, I'll get to it in a minute, but I've just got to keep eating. And, um, yeah, I've been told about meat breeds that have had their lambs taken off them for as long as two days and they hand the lamb back to them and they're fine with it. Whereas breeds like the ones we've got here, and I've seen people's kids make this mistake, Oh, we've got to catch the lamb, we've got to catch the lamb. First thing they do, the lamb's cute, we've got to put it back in the fence, let's catch the lamb to make sure it's safe and forget the mother. Well, that's a great idea, because as soon as your stinking blasted human smell 
gets on the top of this thing's head, you know, just around sort of where it goes from the nose to the eyes, or just, you know, like where it's fringe or it's bangs would be sort of thing. As soon as you get human smell on that, there's quite a chance it'll reject it. And I mean, it just will disown it. The lamb will go to feed and it'll run away and it'll run away and it'll run half a mile trying to avoid this lamb feeding off it because that lamb is not my own because I can smell human on it. This is one of the things. You know, why don't you do this for the lambs? Do that for, you can't physically touch the bastards for the first four weeks. As delicate as they are, you can't touch them. And the same thing, another smell point is where you've got your, so I've got my arms out here, basically your chest, your front of your chest, or just where your neck goes into the chest on the lamb, that's another place they smell. And sometimes they smell their ass as well. Um, but if you're going to, you know, it, it's sort of like the lower neck and, and the start of the chest. If you're going to pick one up, you've got to pick it up by the ribs, and the ribs only, and then hope it doesn't wiggle out, and if it starts to wiggle and get the end of the legs and hold it at the end of the legs, and I usually just go for the ribs. I usually don't try and go for anything because it's best that they're just not touched at all because if there's human smell on it, it's the same as dealing with wild birds, native birds in trees. Any human smell, they'll just balk and let them die. Same thing with these blasted wool breeds. But, as I said, I've heard of somebody who had a meat breed. They took a lamb off for two days and handed it back, and it was fine, and he accepted it straight away. Just part of the dealio. On that note, oh, we've got to talk about maiden ewes. Now, these are ewes that basically have their first lamb. In corridors and merinos and that, I have seen... 80% of them give birth to a lamb and just walk away. Um, drop and run, I call it. Um, I have seen these things give birth to a lamb. This is your first year use, you, you know, your females with their first lamb. I've seen them give birth to a lamb. The lamb follows them they freak out and run away from their own lamb, scared of this thing that's following them and they don't know what it is. Yeah, I shit you not, fearful of their own lambs. I have seen that one. It, it's friggin' hilarious and sad at the same time because you know the little bugger's going to die. Um, why don't you take it in a bottle feed it? Oh, some people do. Fucking hell. And they get like, you know, they're only bottle feeding like 18 of the bloody things. Cock limey, you know. And and some that are real expensive, it's bloody well worth doing it. And others, like, it's just a oh, big task. Once they get to a certain age, you know, once they get around that three or four week mark and they're used to you and they know exactly that it's you're coming and it's feeding time and you've got the warm milk, bang, they're into it. It does cost a lot in milk. I don't think you can just... No, you can't, actually. You can't really give them cow's milk. You, you can, but you're supposed to put cooking oil in with it um, or maybe water it down. But what will happen if you give lambs that have been abandoned, if you give them cow milk, which we did with one of them, um, they sort of have this bloated guts, and I mean, this bloated guts, I mean, this, this sheep now is like, shit, what is it, like eight years old? And it's still got bloated guts. And it's it's like with them for life. They, you know, this thing has had umpteen lambs of its own. I, actually, I delivered its first lamb it had. Um, but they get bloated guts, and they have like a bloated gut look their whole life. And uh, this particular one was sort of stunted. It never really got very big as such. And it had the bloated guts. But it did produce enough other lambs. So, I mean, I suppose it wasn't, you know, 
complete failure and, and all that. I mean, you know, hell, it made it to eight years old. It can't be too bad at all. Um, it's still alive, this sheep, by the way. Um, that was one that my sister found that had been abandoned and it was basically... I mean, it was that hopeless, it couldn't even sit up. And I don't know how, but we managed to save it. And, I mean, it was remarkable that we saved it. <clears throat> but 80% of first-year ewes will be bloody hopeless and basically leave their lamb to die. This is the case with your Merinos, your Corridales, your, your wool breeds. Um, and, like, it's just... It's, it's like a, a watching a bloody massacre unfold. It really is. It's bullshit. And there's nothing you can really do about it. This is the, the bad part about it. Um, but that's the way it goes. And usually after the first one, you know, they, they might be all right with it. And, you know, and I've seen the occasional 20% that are good, you know, and you can look at this you and you think, you're not even fully grown yourself, and here you are, diligently caring after your lamb, and you think, you friggin' ripper. You're one of the, the bloody money sheep, you know. You're one of the ones that's, you know, holding the bottom line up, you know, <laughs> unlike all the others that I've got to fucking pick up the next day. Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, I tend to have more experience with wool breeds than meat breeds in case you don't realise. Um, I will note alpacas are completely different. Alpacas will actually, <laughs> the good ones, uh, will actually die protecting their young. I mean, they will know they're going to be eaten and will get eaten by wolves and, and stuff in South America. You know, and they will die protecting their young. Sheep, no, not so much, nowhere near it. <laughs> um, but anyway, as I said, wind chill factor is one thing that does get to the lambs. Um, they're, they're freaking dumb. I mean, like, they're, when they're young, in the first couple of weeks, they are chronically stupid. Um, I have seen them trying to, like, they'll do two different things if they can't find their mother. Stand exactly where they are in the hail and bloody wind, bear, 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 and just stand in the one spot. Other times, they'll just start randomly following different sheep, trying to feed off different sheep to see which sheep will accept it. And I've seen lambs that are only just born um, picking the wrong mother and then this one who you know isn't their mother won't just run away to stop it feeding it'll literally turn around and butt the bastard straight into the dirt not joking and the thing's only a few hours old and it goes are you my mother comes up to feed off it and this sheep just turns around and goes bang and just slams it into the dirt all your fairy stories from the animal activists about cruelty. The biggest cruelty comes from other friggin' sheep or their own mother. I can guarantee you that shit because I've seen it all my life. Um, and some will be nice enough to walk away. Uh, most will just run away. But if they're in yards or anything like this, and this is the danger at shearing ones that are, are heavily pregnant, and one's born in, in yards, you know, and it goes to feed off another sheep, it's liable to just get butted by the other sheep into the dirt, um, which is bloody bad. But, um, yeah, the uh, other thing I've seen them do, aside from just follow sheep, other sheep and try and feed off them. Sometimes instead of going for the back of the sheep, and this can be a problem with some new lambs, it takes them a while to work it out, all they know is they've got to go for the legs. And so they keep trying to nuzzle around in the wool of the front legs of their mother, not finding the teat. And uh, the other one I wanted to mention, I should have mentioned it first, um, 
this is the most ridiculous one I've seen, is a sheep uh, like a lamb trying to find its mother. Are you me mother? Are you me mother? Are you me mother? Are you know what I've done? End up following a sheep dog, trying to think that the sheep dog was its mother, even though all the sheep are white and the dogs black. Yeah. Um, and the dogs are bloody darn sight shorter than the sheep was. <laughs> I think it was a border collie or something from memory. Uh, could have been a kelpie. But, um, the, you know, sheep dog breeds. But yeah, you know, never underestimate the, uh, brainlessness of a, um, young lamb. Delivery, you don't need to worry too much generally although delivery is sort of my specialty. Um, how they come out, they, you got your head and your nose and you'll have your feet more or less like just behind the jaw, like almost where the cheeks are sort of thing, but just behind the jaw sort of thing. And that's the way they'll come out. Now, the, the danger of that is because of the way their, their legs, um, you get your hoof and then it's sort of like another... <coughs> The lamb, it's like oh, three and a half, maybe four inches before they got a joint. And what will happen is instead of it coming out with the head and the feet like that, it'll bloom and bend at the joint and the foot will go down like that into the vagina and then it blocks it part way. So you got to sort of basically, no easy way to say this, you got to stick your hand down there and basically uh well grab hold of preferably both hooves and, and pull it out and you may notice that you you got to sort of just grab your hooves with your fingers like that because the head will be where your palm is and let me tell you there is no spare room there's not barely a bloody quarter inch of extra room for anything else really so you really it's not a job for a person who doesn't have very flexible hands that can cave right in like that or you know terribly thick fingers it, it just <clears throat> it's not easy but at the end of the day every time I get a out I usually because they've got a, a mouth much the same as a dog I usually put my hands on either side of the mouth and go and just lightly blow in to expand lungs the first time um, I will say that she, you don't want to do that too hard. Uh, if you're worried about the whole smell thing I told you, don't worry. They're still covered in friggin' slops and yellow shit. And it's, they ge generally have yellow shit on their back, but they're covered in what seems like clear snot. And so the smell doesn't really transfer. And the mother, if she's a good enough mother, will actually try and lick it off them. On the very odd occasion, how's this? You may know we cut the tails off sheep. On the very odd occasion, the mother will actually bite the tail off the lamb, but not quite to the length we will. It might bite it like four or five inches down on a tail that's eight and a half, nine inches long. Yeah, that has happened. My father's seen it happen in front of him. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but you see these ones that are young and you think either a fox has tried to grab you or the mother has literally just bit your tail off. And uh, they surprisingly seem about five inches long for some reason, maybe five and a half inches long, which is very bizarre that you have all these the odd sheep, the odd lamb which comes up and you think, that's odd. It's probably that the mother... I'm not saying it happens all the time, but occasionally the mother will bite it off. And you might see it, you know, you know once or twice a year out of a flock of 200 or whatever. Um, but, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, if, you, if they come out on their own and you're there to hear it, you really should not interfere. If you don't need to, don't interfere. Average labour of a sheep is, oh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half maximum. If it's taken more than an hour and a half, if it's taken more than an hour and 20 minutes, you probably should 
go have a look. Um, if it's all happening on its own, let it bloody happen on its own. Because if you get involved and start patting the sheep and looking the sheep in the eye or looking it in the face and, and talking to it and all you'll upset the whole thing. And guess what? It'll leave it there and do a friggin' runner. So many times it will do that. It's only a case of if it's in trouble that you should step in. If it's not in trouble, leave it alone because it's likely to abandon the bloody thing. Um, but, yeah. And uh, whether their first bars actually sound quite like a cat meowing. No shit. The first two or three bars they make in their life. Um, particularly if you don't sort of go and open their lungs up. But I've just got into the habit of that just to ensure that it actually bloody survives, you know, to make sure that it's got its first breath instead of just sort of let it lay there and just die. And some people are dumb enough that they'll just let it lay there and die. And if I can sell this bastard in later times for 80 bucks, I'm going to at least go to make sure it's going to make it or give it a bit of a better chance. Um, having said that, it's, it's some, it doesn't matter if it's mother neglect, windshield factor, if you work all those out, there is, and the government researches this sort of crap, uh, that research of diseases, animal diseases in the city near me, they've got a great massive laboratory and they've got every animal disease you can think of in laboratory conditions and they research the shit out of them and um, we don't have rabies in Australia but apparently they've got it held in there in one of their freezer vaults or whatever um, and they reckon a lot of these deaths that occur without a rhyme or reason um, is by bacteria of one sort or another which they can't exactly identify because it varies what bacteria it may be, um, that sort of gets a stronghold on the young lamb's body and wipes it out. There was um, another guy's place I was dealing with and he had quite a number of these ones that would, they look fine and you'd think, oh, it's just an abandoned lamb. And I took one of them home and another bloke that worked there did as well. And no matter what we done, they would die before too long. I mean, the, you look at it and say, it's got no mother, but it's about, you know, a week, week and a half old. What's going on here? Um, but I reckon it was more. I reckon they were... Let's try and think back now. No, I reckon they are two and a half, three weeks old. And you say, the thing's just abandoned. How did it make it to this point? Well, the mother must have been able to smell what's going on because every time we take... I took one home, he took friggin' half a dozen of them home. Um, every time you try and get them to go, they'd be dead within... Like, you, you take them home, you keep them warm. Hell, I'll let my one in the house in front of the heater. They'd be dead in 12 hours or less. Mine only survived friggin' three or four hours. And I saw, and this is the way, there's a whole heap of tips and tricks I'll give you on veterinary stuff. Um, I could see, like, it, it just seemed to die. It seemed to stop breathing. And I looked, and, the, and I thought, shit, the bastards stopped breathing. And so I started <laughs> mouth to mouth, you know. You just blow in, and the weight of its ribs, and that'll blow back out. And you <laughs> and you know, I seemed to be holding it for a while there and after doing it for several minutes, I thought, geez, it must be all right now. And the eyes started to expand, so I breathed again and then I left it and it wasn't breathing and the eyes just, whoop, the pupils went big. And instead of stuff arsing around with breathing and pulse and all that bullshit, I usually, the first thing I check, I just go straight for the eye and check what the pupil's doing. And if the pupil's really big, you're too late. Um, and yeah, but as far as we know, it must have been some sort of bacteria, but it was just funny that the mothers would abandon them at that, even though they're two and a half, three weeks old, and the mother was nowhere to be found, and I reckon they, the mother knew that the thing was dying and abandoned it. 
Um, but yeah, the the other thing, ran in the muck. You have got to work as a team. You've got to work with a pack mentality, like a pack of wolves, running things up. You will often get the one leader at the front who wants to be the biggest prick you could imagine and try and double back on you and try and I had one deliberately run me into a rocky area and brought the whole flock into this rocky steep area and I was clapping and waving my hands and move you bastard didn't want to move I got in right up close to it still didn't want to move clapping and yelling and stuff and nah and so I kept going in and when I was getting closer to it then it took off and took the whole flock with it but you know what it had got me right in amongst a whole bunch of boulders on a steep area. And then the bastard said, now's our chance to double back on him because it took him so long to get into these boulders, it's going to take him a bloody long time to hop over the top of these friggin' four-foot-tall rocks and get out again. And they're smart. And if you get one at the front of the pack that seems to be leading the entire flock, don't be surprised if it's an intelligent real friggin smart ass piece of shit that's going to do everything it can to stuff your day up by trying to outrun one of you who are hurting them to get back into the main paddock as opposed to be herded up um there's some of them that get quite stroppy when they're in yards my uncle's board listers were terrible for it you know, they just, they just run like these pigs at work. Nothing was going to stop them. And if your legs are in the way, they just flatten you. Um, but board lessers are quite a lot larger than merinos. Um, anyway, I think that's enough for now. And I'll talk a bit about uh, some of the other technicalities at a later date.